It's great to be here. It's an honor to be in this role. Um, I love UT. I love Austin, born and raised here. And um, it's a real treat to have Josh Berry here. Josh is a very, very close friend um, and has done a tremendous amount for the Austin community. Um, he's been a longtime entrepreneur himself, um, started multiple companies. We're going to talk about that in detail and what his lessons learned are from those. Um, and most recently, he started the Capital Factory. And Capital Factory has become a real force for Austin. Um, in my opinion, it's the strongest incubator we have here. Um, I recently attended the demo day. I was very impressed with the companies presenting. Um, the room was packed with potential investors. And that's pretty amazing, because it hasn't been that long since he, uh, he put one foot in front of the other and started the Capital Factory. So why don't we jump in, Josh, with uh, just how you got started as an entrepreneur. So as a child, what was the initial spark for you? You know, it's funny. When I, uh, when I look back at my family, uh, I see entrepreneurs everywhere. And they, they weren't tech entrepreneurs. They didn't start some company that went public. But both of my grandparents on both sides ran small retail stores. Mm -hmm. My father was a photographer, but he had his own little photography studio. And so he was, ran it out of our house. And he was you know, shooting weddings and bar mitzvahs and portraits and things like that. And had yep. to run his own little business there. My mom was a school teacher, but had a business on the side that she did with, that went along with my dad's business, doing like invitations and stationery and stuff for all the parties that he did. Um, and, uh, and it just seemed like everywhere I look around through that, there are, there are entrepreneurs. But, and so then when I, I got to college, I went to Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh and uh, in kind of the first dot, dot com boom. And I remember I was sitting on uh, at some fraternity house uh, the first week of school, like during rush, and kind of meeting different people. And I meet some, uh, someone that later on became a good friend of mine. And we're sitting on the wall talking about it. And he says, you know, what do you, what do you really want to do? How are you here at school? What do you want to get out of it? And I said to him right then, I said, you know, I, I don't really know. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what business it's going to be. But I want to start a company before I, before I leave school. And, um, and, I, and I was pretty sure that was my path. But I had no idea what that was going to be. I didn't, I didn't know anything about anything. I didn't know there was nothing I was passionate about. I just knew I wanted to work for myself. And then I wanted to start a company. And then uh, the way I got involved in my first company was, uh, was really by accident. And, you know, you look at, you know, it's, it's interesting as I've, watched you go through your story and you've developed different businesses and you've been, in many cases, very, very intentional about it. And for me, most of them were accidents. And my first business was, was totally an accident. I was, um, I had, was, I was working for a, a software company in college for my freshman year and I was kind of doing what today would be like a social media intern. There wasn't any social media then, so I was answering questions on news groups and email lists and other places, but like you would on Twitter or Facebook today. And, uh, and I was doing a little bit of programming. And I was doing, and the people asking for help would hire me on the side to do like consulting work, to like write a little script for them or a little program or customize something. And, uh, and if their server would break, they'd call me and I might come fix it. And they might order me some pizza or something at the time. And then one day, one of my uh, consulting customers called me up and he said, hey, you know, every time my server breaks, it's a, real, it's a big pain in the ass. It, it's like it disrupts my business. It disrupts my customers. I don't care so much about paying you to fix it. It's I just don't want it to break. Mm -hmm. But your server <laughs> that you run on your computer, at least from my perspective, it, it runs all the time. Because if it breaks, you see it right away and you go fix it. And I don't have, you know, it just, it's, so how about, how about I just pay you 50 bucks a month and you run my server on yours and you take care of it? And, um, and today, that doesn't sound like that big of an idea, because most of the time, you wouldn't run a server by yourself. But back then, there was no such thing as hosting. If you wanted to run a website, you got a computer, and you plugged it into the internet, and you ran a web server. And then you put web pages on it. You didn't go put it somewhere else. And uh, so this was kind of a new idea of, I was going to get paid to host it. And of course, optimistically, I'm thinking, well, nothing's ever going to go wrong, so I'm just getting 50 bucks a month for free. Um, and, uh, and that was basically the beginning of what became my first company, which was a, an email hosting business. And so then I was able to organically kind of grow additional customers after that. And, and did, you, did you employ all students for that business? And were they all 
Uh, mostly, for fr mostly fraternity brothers. Yeah, right. It was which was which is not necessarily a strategy I would recommend. Um, but um, <laughs> but it was. Uh, it but leads yeah, to I mean, stronger I just, hazing. I just or? looked around and I was like, oh well, you know, I need somebody to help with customer service. Great, can you come help with this? Answer some of these customer service emails. And then, okay, we had some consulting work to do. Oh, great, I knew one of my other friends was a programmer. And I said, okay, great. I, I kind of scoped everything out and could kind of just hand them the project. Here's what. Here's read this thing. Look at this thing. Look at this thing. Make it do this, right? And then I'd get it back, look at it, make sure it did it, and then hand it to the client. Um, and so, yeah, just basically, very opportunistically, hired up all the people around me. And, and you completely bootstrapped that company, right? You never took outside I, I did, money. yeah. So, I mean, I, um, you know, at first there was this first customer paying me 50 bucks a month, and I was hosting it, like, you know, in my dorm room, on the school's network, on the computer my parents bought me. Like, I hadn't paid for anything. It didn't have any expenses. So that was kind of could just let that ride. But at the point where I started making kind of thousands, hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars a month, I started to feel like, okay, I'm, there's some liability here. The, what does it mean to be a real business? I, didn't, mm -hmm. I was intimidated by that. And, um, and so uh, the first thing I did was I went to uh, one of my mentors who had a small business that he had just started. And I said, hey, I was afraid of doing my business, the business by myself. So I was like, can I just make mine like a sub company, like a part of your business? And I did it actually under him for a few months until I realized that that was stupid. There was nothing. I was actually just, you know, he, I was giving him a percentage of the, a cut of the, all the money I collected, and he wasn't really doing anything. And so right. I was like, oh, no, he wasn't doing anything wrong. He, he was doing what I asked him to do. But there was, there was no, I wasn't getting any real benefit out of it, and I got more comfortable with it, and I eventually incorporated myself. But, but yeah, I, I basically just um, was able to start, again, in my dorm room, on the computer my parents bought me. Someone was paying me. Someone paid me a little bit more. I got my, I had a credit card. I got, you know, a couple thousand dollars for, you know, on the credit card racked up. Um, and basically bootstrapped it from there and was able to incrementally grow it. By the time I graduated four years later, I was doing hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in revenue. You know, it's like as a looking at the businesses that we build today or the businesses I see now, it's not, I, I consider that more of a lifestyle business. It wasn't like some big business, but I was like, I was totally the richest college kid around. Like I was, I, right. you know, like it was, I was awesome. I was say, that's was, a lot of money. It was awesome when I was in college, yeah. And I, and I thought I was like top of the world. Um, and, uh, and so it was, you know, at that point, I was able, I was, had the luxury of being able to say, okay, what do I want to do? Do I want to go interview and you know, take a job somewhere? Do I want to keep doing this and run this business that I have? And, uh, and, and I did both of those things. I came down here and took a job at Trilogy, which was as far from a real job as you can get, but was uh, where, I, where I was put into an incubator and was doing startups there, and then I continued to, uh, to run that on the side. And what the heck did your parents think? Were they, I mean, were they supportive or were they, you know, my parents, like, you know, you need to. I, I never had those kinds of issues with my parents. My yeah. parents were pretty supportive. I, I, was, I was just talking with them recently and thinking about, as I, now I have kids and I'm trying to raise them. And, um, and I, you know, I just was on a mission. I always had stuff I wanted to go do. And it was, I definitely got into trouble, but I was generally doing good stuff. And even the trouble my dad would look at and go like, oh, yeah, I would have done that too. Um, and uh, so. So they were pretty supportive. Like I was, they could tell I was on a path and doing stuff. And I didn't, I didn't drop out of school. I, like, mm -hmm. you know, I was doing it on the side. And so so, they so were why, okay. why work at Trilogy while you're doing your own business? Like that seems pretty stressful. Yeah, that was a great question. So, so Trilogy, which I don't know how many of you, who's heard of Trilogy? So not that many of you. So, um, so I came here. I graduated in 1999, which is the peak of the first dot com boom. And Trilogy was a very, very large growing company here in, uh, in Austin, started by a guy named Joe Lemont. And they were recruiting very heavily from Stanford, MIT, Carnegie Mellon, and a lot of other top tech schools. They were competing against, at the time, Microsoft and maybe Google's around. I don't think so. But uh, you know, all the, the, the people that were doing the top recruiting. Um, and they had an enterprise software business, similar to SAP or Oracle today. Um, but they also were putting $100 million into an incubator to go create new internet startups. And uh, they were particularly looking for entrepreneurs to be part of that, to be part of that incubator. And so even though I had my own company and I thought I was king of the world and I didn't need to do anything, uh, another friend of mine, John Berkowitz, had graduated a semester before me. And he'd come down here to work at Trilogy. And he said, hey, you, know, you, really gotta, you should really come check this out. One, mm -hmm. Trilogy is super cool. It is surrounded by really a lot of really smart people that are doing really interesting things. And you could learn a lot here. And they're looking for entrepreneurs. They're looking for people like you to, to, to come do really cool things. And two, Austin's really cool. Austin's a great place. And I think you'd really like it if you check it out. And so I came down to interview with them and, uh, and loved Austin and loved the environment at Trilogy. And Joe, the CEO of, Trilo of Trilogy, uh, basically sold me saying, hey, look, you know, one, you've been running this business on the side in school. 
So I don't care. You can keep running it on the side. Go ahead. You know, bring it down with you. Mm -hmm. And so there's no downside for you. Two, I'm going to surround you with a whole bunch of really smart people. You've been doing this all by yourself. I'm going to surround you with all these really smart people. Right. I'm going to give you a bunch of money to go learn things and try things and do things. And you can learn on my dime. And then when you're done, you can go back and go run your company. And I, I, he was trying to sell me to join the company, so I don't think he really expected me to actually do that, right, but that sure. is exactly what I did. Right. Um, and, I was, and it worked great, and I got to, it moved me to Austin and introduced me to so many great people. I learned so much while I was at Trilogy and from a lot of really great people and got some great experiences. We launched the company in three months. We sold it a year later for $20 million. I, so I, I, I sold a, uh, I, 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 I was doing sales in, in, the, in one role there, and I, I went and got a million dollar sale, like I closed a million dollar deal, which was really a great milestone for me personally, really built my confidence and other things. Uh, it turns out that's the same as doing any other deal, it just has more zeros at the end, but you have to do that to, to know that. Um, and uh, so it was a great experience for me, and then when we, it turned out, because we built it and we sold the company a year later, uh, it was just a natural time for me to exit as we mm -hmm. sold the other company, and then what do you know, my company was still growing, and I was actually... Now, the first time I was focused on my company full time was right. around 2000 when I left Trilogy, and, and then it started to really go. So you, you were at Trilogy for how many years then? Just, just one. Okay, just one. Yeah. And I um, basically got the, per, like the most fun part of Trilogy, like the peak right. of the dot-com boom just from 99 to 2000. And then it kind of, the dot-com boom ended, and it wasn't as fun of a place to be anymore. Right. And we, and we initially met in 2003 or four. Or I think yeah, it? probably three yeah. at a Bootstrap Austin event, maybe. And and you you were still bootstrapping it. You never took any money. Yeah, never took any money. And for that um, business. and then we became um, intertwined because you you asked me if you should sell the business. Well, no, I think we we must have gotten together before that. We did because no, no, no. But that's where we that. became really close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Through yeah, that and so, th so then it was yeah, and it was really an issue of do I sell the business or go raise money? Mm -hmm. Which is interesting. That's often be a choice that you would face. Is you know, do you? It's kind of like do you uh, leave the exit the business or double down? You know, and, and go further. Um, and that was a really you know really tough choice because that was my baby. I'd been working on it for ten years. I'd put as far as I was concerned my whole life into it, and, um, and certainly at the time. And uh, and it's really scary to think about what that means to go into this, you know, to sell your company, to go through that experience, to lose control. Um, you, you, don't, you know, you're trying to figure out what's, what, what's the right amount of money, what, what's worth it, what's not worth it. Mm -hmm. um, and and there, there was a lot of tough things to figure that out. That was the, the selling your first company is the most emotional, like sure. hardest part. After that, it's always emotional, but it's like not nearly as, as tough as the first time. And so that, that, was, your, that was your first uh, significant financial event. Yeah. And to be honest, life. that was one of the biggest reasons I did, that I decided to do it then, is I, I felt like um, I used a, a racetrack analogy a lot at the time, and it was like, I need to get all the way around the track, because I know I want to do more than one company. I want to do more than one lap around the track, and so I need to finish this lap <laughs> so I can go do right. another one. And, I, and you know, just like anything you do a second time, it's, there's, you learn a lot, and it's a lot easier and, and, and often better you know, the next time, and yeah. I wanted to get to that second time. So then, what did you do right after you sold it? You've, you've got you've got now financial independence. You're you're in a totally different mindset. I bought a Tesla. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that was one of I the remember. First, that was one of the first things. No, I uh, remember that. What did I do? So actually, you ordered one. Yeah, I ordered like it. Three years. I had to, wait, ago, I had to right. wait three years for it to come, but I I paid for it. Um, so uh, so you know. Tip, so the, the first thing when you sell your company, almost all the time, you're actually committed to staying part of the company because usually uh, they want you, in addition to the company, to be part of it because uh, as, as the founder. And so I had a pretty typical kind of two-year deal right. where I was expected to stay on and be with the company. And uh, and I, if I, you know, they, the way they enforce that is they put some big chunk of money sitting out there that says, if you are still here two years from now, this is what you get. Um, and so, uh, so I spent, you know, the first year after selling your company is, uh, I find in my, I've done it a couple times now, is actually goes by really, really fast and is primarily transition. It's all, there's all this stuff to do now because you just sold the company. So you have to announce it and then you have to talk to all the employees and they have, they have to learn, meet all the other people they're going to work with and work for and then kind of making, integrating the organization to be part of the other company, which basically means taking everybody that used to report to you and getting them to report to somebody else. Um, and then you get to the end of that process, and that's usually like a year later. 
And, uh, and then you get to kind of start to say, okay, what's my role now? What, am I gonna be part of this new company? What can mm -hmm. I do there? Um, do I go on to do something else? Um, so in the case of my first company, that first year went really fast. Second year was completely frustrating and, uh, and very, very emotionally difficult for me. And it was interesting, it was the reason it was so hard was actually because I, I didn't have enough to do. Um, that, that we had transitioned everything and the new company didn't really empower me to go do a lot of new things. Um, and I just didn't, I didn't feel fulfilled, even though I actually kind of had a dream job. Like I had an apartment in New York and then and I had my place here that was paid for by them and I could fly back and forth whenever I wanted and I got paid a lot of money and I didn't really have anybody reporting to me. I didn't have that much I had to do. Like it sounds great, but it was actually completely frustrating and, right. and, and really emotionally taxing. So what, what was your darkest moment with Skyless? Could have it wasn't all rosy, right? No, no way. I mean, doing a startup and particularly bootstrapping one, it's just like a series of thinking you're about to fail until it actually works. Like the whole time, everything is about to fall apart and then and until you get to some kind of sustainable part. Uh, and so, um, you know, I remember in particular as, you know, we started the business and like a lot of people might do, I first was running it where I didn't actually have any employees. Everybody who worked for me was a contractor and the, you know, different states have different laws about what makes someone an employee versus a contractor. I'd say it's probably pretty common that a lot of small companies kind of fudge those rules a little bit because it's just less paperwork and easier and less taxes and other things not to have a, uh, not to be, not to pay everyone as a contractor. And so for the first couple of years where, I, where everybody's doing it part time and other things like that, everybody got paid as a contractor. And then at one point I had, you know, 10, 15 employees and um, we started to realize, you know, my tax advisor and legal advisor started saying like, hey, you really need to change these people to be employees because they're really employees. And um, so we go through the process and we change the structure of the company and we get our, everyone set up as an employee and we register properly and we do all these other things. And we get health insurance and we, and, uh, but I didn't actually pay any of the taxes. <laughs> so I, <laughs> so, so then like, you know, like six months later. No one is here from the IRS. Right, nobody's here from the IRS. Um, just, just met, oh, oh, sorry, the government's actually so that, shut so then, down. Yeah, government shut down right now, we're safe. So then, um, <laughs> Wait, the IRS isn't shut down, I don't think. Uh, uh, essential yeah, services, that's true. yeah. yeah. Uh, so, then, um, so then, like, you know, it comes towards the end of the year, and, and suddenly I get this bill from the IRS, and they're like, you owe us like $100,000, like more than that. And, um, and, and, and I, I remember, I can just remember my, my, feeling my face flush, like feeling like really embarrassed and scared, and that was a really a lot of money at the time. Like, that was, um, that was really, I didn't, I suddenly, like, I, I didn't, I, I'd never been in trouble with the IRS. I didn't know, were they gonna come break the door down? Were they gonna, like, freeze all our bank accounts? Were they, did they expect me to pay this tomorrow? Like, this is all the stuff I'm thinking. I didn't realize mm -hmm. that actually owing $100,000 to debt to the IRS is not really that big of a deal, and lots of people do that. Um, and they'll put you on a payment plan, and, like, you can negotiate it, and, like, there's all these other things. It's totally a workable situation. But there was about, about a week or two where I was really, really stressing it, and I really felt terrible, and, um, I, you know, it's the kind of thing like when it's your business and something like that happens, like you don't just, just get sad about it. I mean, it affects you physically in other ways. Like, I mean, it's like I like couldn't eat. I like wouldn't, you know, like I was depressed. I was like, I mean, it's like it, it really hits you. And I, all these people that were depending on me that I kind of felt like I'd let down, right? That, um, and, I, and, I, and again, I'm thinking like, is my whole business gonna go away? Like what's gonna happen? Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that's something I'll always remember as a, as a really dark time for me that actually turned out to be nothing. I mean, that's, that's the other, one of the lessons out of it. Like it was totally not a big deal. It really it was negotiable. We got on payment plan. About a couple months later, it was all paid off. It wasn't, a, didn't, you know, no problem. One of my mentors told me, it's never as good as you think it is. It's never as bad as you think it is. It's probably pretty true. Um, so then, then we, we, we did get into a formal business relationship with Bizarre Voice. Yes, I thought I was doing Brett was a favor. Turns out he was doing me a favor. I often think about that. <laughs> Well, we need to get to market fast. Yeah. And um, Brant and I came to Josh and his, his team and uh, said, can you guys build the first version of ratings and reviews? Yeah, and so I had, I had a fairly three months. large team up and running with a bunch of programmers. And, um, and yeah, Brett needed to get, get going. And so um, that, was, that, was, that was a lot of fun. And, um, and turned out, again, I thought, kind of thought I was doing him a favor. Like I just met him. Fairly recently, he was starting a new company. I knew he was a successful guy. He'd started some other successful companies. I, I liked him, um, but uh, but I thought I was just kind of doing him a favor and helping him to build this this new company he had an idea for. Which I'll embarrassingly admit, like I didn't really even totally get it. Like I was like, "You're going to do ratings and reviews? Like are people going to pay you a lot of money for that? Like I didn't I, I didn't totally understand it. But I was like, you know what? We'll we'll do this and you know see what happens later. And 
whatever. And, uh, and as a result, Brett, being a very good entrepreneur, he was watching his budget really carefully. So he beat me up on the price for that, where at first I thought I was going to make a little bit of money. And by the end of it, I think I was losing a little bit of money. Like, it probably, I think it was $12,000 a month you're paying for, yeah, like, I think that's for right. about yeah. for like two or three people. So it's probably costing me like fifteen or fifteen thousand. I mean, I was, he's mostly covering it, but not quite. Um, but then, in addition to that, I got a stock option grant that was, you know, I, and and it was well, I would assume he told me at the time, and uh, and I believe, but I you know I really had no reference point. It was like kind of like what a first employee would get, and and I didn't, didn't know what that meant. I didn't know like what percentage of the company it was or anything. You couldn't do any calculations to say what it would be worth or anything. Um, but it turned out to be worth millions of dollars. That turned out to be worth a lot of money. <laughs> so uh, that, that turned out worked out pretty well. And turned out Brett was doing me a favor. It could have turned out to be worth zero. It could have been nothing. But um, it, it turned out to be worth a lot of money. So then, then uh, you know, after Skylist, and you got the mojo back, and and um, decided you were kind of frustrated, want to create something else, um, you created other inbox. Yeah. Which was actually my third company. There was a second company in the middle that spun out oh, of, 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 of Skylist. But, um, but, but yeah, but uh, the Inbox was interesting because in particular, I was like, OK, I've done two companies now. I'm kind of a badass. Like, I know what I'm doing. And I'm going to go. Now I'm going to go do something really big. And oh, I've got this really big idea. You know, I, mean, I was talking to you a lot at the time. And I had some different ideas. And there was other Inbox. And there was the backup thing. Remember the backup idea? There was the yeah, I was I at the time. Yeah which now Backupify, or whatever they're called now, is like basically that business model. Yep. Um, and, um, and, and I was like, OK, I'm gonna, I've got this idea. I've got this thing I've been doing. And it's going to, I understand email and marketing, how it works. And this is going to really change things. And, um, and so I had this whole thing. We went into stealth, and we worked on it. We raised some money. And, um, and then we launched it. And it wasn't really the right idea. And, uh, and then we kind of accidentally fell into what became the right idea out of that, but it was, uh, but it was, it was an interesting lesson for me in that I'm sure people do come up with like really good, brilliant ideas and go like, that's the thing. But pretty much everything that's worked for me has been much more of an opportunity that just kind of slapped me in the face. Like someone offered to pay me to run their server on my, on my, on my network, or a law got passed that changed all the rules for what we were doing, so we had to make something for that. Or in the case of other inbox, Yahoo came along and said, "Hey, we're launching an app store. Can you make that work?" For our thing, um, and we we're like, no, it can't really work with your thing actually because it only works with Gmail. Um, but and then we kind of like reconfigured it and kind of dumbed it down a little bit. We thought we were dumbing it down. We thought we were like hurting the product, like taking stuff out of it. Turned out that actually made it so everybody could use it. And uh, and then Yahoo got about three million people to sign up and use it. And and that company had a pretty good outcome as well. Other inbox. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say it's you know it was, it was a single. It wasn't like a Huge success, um, uh, out exit-wise, because we we had an inflection point where, again, like I was saying before, you could, we could have either raised more money right. or sold the company. Um, and what we did is we sold it to a company that could then take what we were doing and bring it to market much faster. And so, actually, when I when I say it was a single, part of it is is because it's not fully realized yet. So a big chunk of the compensation comes in stock. That company's still going. That you know, that's return path, which is you know, a big company and doing well, and will probably go public, you know, sometime in the next couple of years, and then maybe it will be a home run after that. Um, but um, but right now, it was primarily about um, you know, what's the best way to grow this and to, and to make it move forward, and we're able to do that with return path. And so, right. um, so I kind of think of it in the middle. So when when does Capital Factory enter into all of this? Post other inbox, or you were kind of in parallel doing. Yeah, I was already doing other inbox, um, and I was, I was still doing other inbox. And um, it was the end of 2008, and it was the first. This, it was the the economic downturn around the housing market. Yeah. Which for me was my second economic crash. So the first one was the first dot com crash, um, right? Which I had had been through, and and was pretty much weathered really well because. That was right as I was leaving Trilogy. And even though it was the dot-com crash, actually, Skylist really boomed and did really well during that time. So I didn't really feel that. And then, but I'd lived through it, and I'd heard all these stories about it, and I knew about it. And so then this was happening again. And this, this seemed a little different. Like, the dot-com crash was primarily in the US, mm -hmm. whereas this was clearly global. Yeah, and, it was um, very different. It was very different, and, and I could feel that, and I could sense. And it was, and the thing that I remember the most was just this feeling of kind of helplessness, mm -hmm. of like, wow, there's all this stuff changing around me that I can't control, right. that I can't influence. And as an entrepreneur, one of the great things is like feeling like you're in control, and you can influence things and make decisions and make things happen. 
And, I, and I, so I really didn't like that. And, um, and so then I was, you know, also hopefully as an entrepreneur, I was like, okay, well, what, what can I do about it? What can I, what, what's my response to this thing? How do, I, how do I do something about it? How do I control it? And, um, and, and I felt like both at the micro scale and at the macro scale, the best thing I could do was go help start more companies. Mm -hmm. Because I really believe that entrepreneurs and technology were gonna still gonna, I didn't think like that the, like the tech boom was over, like the internet wasn't gonna continue to make things work better, faster, cheaper, more transparently, and everything like it's still doing. Um, and yet at the same time also feeling like, wow, maybe we're at a, a local minimum. You know, like maybe we're at a, a, at a valley and, right. uh, and things are bad, which means from here on it's gonna get better. Right, and, um, and that actually sounded like a great time to go start a whole bunch of companies. When you're gonna have a rising tide effect, when the economy is gonna be getting better around you, when other people probably aren't starting companies right now, so maybe there's less competition, um, and there's something that you can do about it. And so that was, I think, if there was any kind of impetus, it was, yeah. it was the market crash. <laughs> Combine that with Y Combinator had just started and Techstars had just started, and I kind of was like following those and thought they sounded super fun and super cool, and I'd been through Trilogy University, which was, also in many ways like an incubator kind of boot camp type thing. So I had some experience with that, knew that was really fun. And so it was a combination of one, this feeling and what can I do about it, and two, wow, that actually looks like the most fun thing I could go do, let's, let's go do that. Why doesn't Austin have one of those? We should do that too. And, and how, how, do you, how do you measure the success of Capital Factory today? Oof. That's a good question. I feel like we're you know, just barely starting um, to see some of those things. Uh, in the end, the things that I take the most pride in are, you know, first of all, just the people that are involved and yep. what they say and what they get out of it. And so, one, it's just hearing from people who tell me how much it's helped them or it's changed their lives or what they've done and, um, and why it's ma made a difference for them and the people that it inspires. So that feels really good, although that's kind of hard to measure. Um, the, the thing I'm counting is how many millionaires we make. Mm -hmm. How many people's lives we change by kind of freeing them from having to work for somebody else and allowing them to be an entrepreneur, allowing them to, because what do entrepreneurs do? They go, they go change the world, it's kind of by definition. Like you have to make something better, faster, cheaper, you know, fix something. Um, and, uh, and people do that about things that they're passionate about. And that's, that's to me is like the greatest gift you could give anybody is the ability to go do what they're passionate about and make a difference um, and not necessarily kind of you know, work for somebody else. And so that's the thing I'm, I'm measuring. The things other people I think measure us by would be how many companies get funded? How much money do they raise? Do they have an exit? How many jobs do we create? How many, uh, like, how many kind of press and attention and things like that? And I think we do really well along all those different things. Yeah. Um, but, but, but I kind of look at it more at people level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot about that with Bizarre Voice and I'm very proud of the fact that it's created 800 jobs, um, most of them here in Austin. And, um, that it's uh, created now 14 companies and counting. Amazing. And people, people coming out. So the ripple effects are very real. And um, that's why I'm so bullish on Capital Factory, because I, re I really see the beginning of something great. Um, it's very, very exciting. So, so, you know, a lot of people in the room probably don't realize that you also teach here at UT. I do, yeah. That's my, my one, one, one night a week. My, my class is uh, that yeah. Day. So let's talk about that. It's with, uh, it's with, with Bob Metcalf. Metcalf. Yes. So um, so I teach the Longhorn Startup Program um, with Dr. Metcalf and with Ben Dyer. So two mm -hmm. incredible entrepreneurs that have been much much more successful than I have. Um, so I, I get to learn from them every day too, just like everybody else. And um, we uh, we have a couple different components to our program. The uh, core of it is our seminar, which is a weekly uh, weekly evening program on Thursday nights. It's a, a pass-fail course that anybody from any school can take, and even if you're not enrolled, you're welcome to come sit in on. And it happens uh, Thursday nights. We bring in speakers on founders, kind of telling their story of how they started their company, talking about specific startup topics and things people need to learn, uh, and really kind of getting people inspired and energized about entrepreneurship. We have a lab that goes along with that, and the lab is for start students who actually have a startup. It's not students who want to build a startup. It's like they actually have something. They have a product and a customer. Like they built something and someone's kind of using it. And the idea is to give them as much as we can of a, the kind of experience they would get at Capital Factory or Y Combinator or somewhere else, which is 
connecting them with mentors with people from the community that have actually been through this before that can help them, that can point them in the right direction and introduce them to people. Giving them as many of the resources of the school that we can put behind them, giving them an office, getting them uh, you know, uh, other support from the school, tapped into the university IP and other resources, having other free things they get like legal work or hosting or other things, um, just as much support as we can get behind them. And most importantly, just time, getting them time to work on their startup where they get credit that really counts towards graduation for the time they're spending on their startup. And then finally, uh, Dr. Metcalf teaches a, uh, does a studio once a month, which is an opportunity for professors to show off the entrepreneur research that they're working on and show that to the greater community. And there's actually a few other things now starting to come out of the Longhorn Startup Program too. I can't even keep That's track cool. of all of them. And um, how, many, how many business students do you have in the class? You think? It's ranged a lot semester to semester. Um, I would say we probably have 10 or 15 this semester. Right. And that's probably on the lower end. We've had more other semesters. Okay. But we generally get um, a lot, you know, half to two thirds are engineering and computer science students. Right. And then a, a broad mix of management, communications, economics, other disciplines. So this is a McCombs event. We've got to change that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, seriously, I mean, it's an, it's an amazing program and an amazing opportunity for folks. Um, so it's been quite an amazing year for you. It's been fun. President Obama visits Capital Factory. Yeah, that was really cool. That, that was, was really high cool. watermark, for sure. Had, had, what's the inside story on that? Did he just call you? You're hanging out at yeah, home Yeah, yeah, he just gave me a call, you know, and, um, and uh, no. Um, we were, it, was very, it was very fortunate that you know, he was planning a trip to Austin and um, particularly to talk about economic development and you know, what's driving that, what makes Austin so great. And um, you know, I'm sure there were lots of different things that they could highlight as part of that. Um, and we were really fortunate to be part of that and to be as part of what he kind of uh, focused on as what's driving innovation and, and the growth here in Austin. And uh, so we also went to Applied Materials, a very large company here that, that helps drive that. He went to a, one of the local high schools that's um, doing some really innovative things. Uh, and he came by Capital Factory as part of that too. And so uh, I got some email maybe about three weeks before from someone from the White House saying, White House Communications Office saying, hey, we have a senior administration official thinking about making a trip down there. Could we, um, could we maybe stop by next week and, and talk to you about it? I'm thinking it's like, we get a lot of other people coming through, ambassadors and senators and people like that. I'm thinking it's some other person like that. But then the next Monday, these three people in suits show up, and two of them are definitely Secret Service. Like they're just, you know, you can just tell from the way that they right. handle themselves and what they do. And uh, so I'm thinking, okay, maybe this is somebody, maybe this is like the vice president or somebody. It's like somebody like more important. And so we're talking to them, and then we, we start planning things out, and they're talking about like shutting, like, we're gonna have to shut down that whole street, and we're gonna have to do this thing over here, and we're gonna, and suddenly it was like, and they started, they started referring to him as him and him and him. And, uh, and so I was like, okay, I think this, maybe this is really the president. And then, uh, and then they made one or two other comments that then I was pretty sure it was the president, even though they still hadn't said so. Um, and uh, then I don't think we really got confirmation until about really about a week before. Mm -hmm. Then they really started to confirm everything and we knew what it was going to be. And then for that next week, there were Secret Service in our office the whole week, uh, the whole time. Playing. They installed phone lines. They like did all, it was pretty... It was actually really fun. They were so nice and they were so apologetic because they were like in our right. office and they're like, oh, we're so sorry. We're in the way. Everyone's like, no, this is so cool. Like, right. stay here as long as you want. Like, <laughs> please don't leave. Yeah, like, it was, it was really, it was actually really, really fun. Yeah. Uh, and how cool was it that, uh, that he picked Austin as the start of his, of it, his job? It was, it was great. And, you know, regardless of your political affiliation, I mean, to me, that, that was not a political event for us. It wasn't about anyone's particular agenda or anything, but more just recognizing what was going on and, and, and respecting the, the role that he's in. He was awesome. He was just so yeah. great, so easy to talk to, such a great communicator, totally present. Um, he spent about 45 minutes with us. Five startups got to pitch him and like give him their pitch. Um, he didn't invest in any of them, but, um, <laughs> but he... Uh, well, he, but, did, he did have his CTO with him and he said, can you do the due diligence? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> but, but, but it was great. And what I was really impressed the most with about his communication skills and, and, and what he did with that is he heard these five pitches. Um, and I mean, I don't know how many of you guys have worked on your startup pitch, but it's really hard. Like, it's really hard to get a short pitch. A long pitch is easy. You can ram ramble forever. To get your pitch down to something you can say quickly and shortly and have people really understand it, very, very difficult. It's very hard. It's something we spend weeks 
weeks working on and practicing. And he heard these five pitches. They reach about two minutes each. So we're talking 10 minutes or maybe 15 minutes that he heard this. And then about two hours later, he gave a speech at Applied Materials, which I also went to. And in that speech, he said, he's like, hey, you know, I just came from Capital Factory. And I saw that he met a few of these startups. Let me tell you about it. There was this one, and he gives, he, in two sentences, he gives this pitch for this startup that he had just heard. I mean, he didn't know who they were. He had just heard them you know, two hours before. And it was the best pitch for that startup they'd ever had. Like, it was yeah, like, sure. like, he just totally boiled it down and made it so, it was like anybody there could have understood what it was. And it was like, we, I like called up all the startups after, like, go listen to what he said. That's how you describe your company. Right, right. And so, just as a communicator, I was, I was like totally blown away. Like, he to really just immediately got it, was listening, could distill it down to what the core essence was, and could really communicate that clearly to other people. And it's really hard to do. And, you know, it's not a political statement, but I was so, impressed with his intellect um, and his ability to rapid fire assimilate those pitches and fire questions. And even just people. pay attention. Like I just like I, I'm checking my phone all the time when I'm talking to somebody. Like he no, has he so many things present. on his mind and he was totally present. He was totally focused. He, you know, there's no uh, nothing else pulling at him. And then and then this weekend, you know, he sales rained out and you say, well what the hell, I'm gonna get Lionel Richie to play at someone's house. Yeah, we called Obama for that. That was yeah, uh, really. You just favorite. said, "Can yeah. you can yeah. you get him to do that?" No, no. Um, yeah, that was really fun too. That was a different kind of fun. But yes, that's that's being that's being an entrepreneur. That's like turning you know opportunity out of challenges. Josh calls me. Lemons out of lemonade. True story. Um, Sunday, it's like one p.m. in the afternoon. It's like, hey, I'm putting together this thing. Do you want to come? Uh, Lionel Richie's going to play for fifty people in someone's living room. <laughs> Like, dude, I'm with the kids for one thing. It's the weekend. Um, are you serious? You're going to pull this off? And uh, I got a text from, or I texted Josh about 11 o'clock at night. I was like, did you actually pull that off? And he said yes. And I was just like, I'm in awe. <laughs> I mean, I don't know anybody in Austin that could have pulled that off oh. with that little time. That was, that, that, um, was, that was a magic trick, but it was fun. It was, it was, it was insane. Yeah. And I don't um, know if you, you guys are, this is a younger crowd, you may not realize it, but I, I didn't even know how much of a Lionel Richie fan I was until I saw him play at ACL. You know, everybody knows every single word to every one of his songs. It was super, super fun. That was, that was yeah, really great. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Um, so, ha, you know, you're a busy, busy, busy guy. Um, and you've got, uh, you've got three beautiful children, you've got a beautiful wife. How on earth do you stay balanced? Wow, you know, I think um, a lot of people ask me that, and they meet my wife, and they're just like, do you ever see your husband? And she's like, and she's like yeah, I do. Right, uh, right. But uh, it's, um, you know, it's funny. I think that's something that's really different for everybody, mm -hmm. and I've learned that about myself. You know, it's like, I, I think one thing is you don't find your balance by comparing yourself to everybody else, mm -hmm. because it, it's really different for everybody. Sure. Um, but, um, yeah, comparing yourself to everybody else is a surefire way to depression. Yeah, right. to enlightenment. But, um, but yeah, you know, I actually feel like I have a really great balance. I think I don't do some things that a lot of other people do that give me some extra time. Like I don't really watch TV. I'm not really into sports. I feel like that gives me like an extra like 20 hours a week. Like compared right. to half of the way um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I really, I love what I do. Um, and I, you know, I wake up, every, wake up every morning and I am super, and I roll out of bed and I'm super excited about what I'm gonna go do that day. Um, I get a good night's sleep every night. Like I probably I usually sleep like seven, eight hours, um, which I think surprises a lot of people. But it's like if I get a good, if I get eight hours of sleep, I can work the rest of the time I'm awake, like the whole mm -hmm. and not be. But if I get like six hours of sleep, I'm kind of like I'm dragging mm -hmm. that that whole day. So I've learned like I need to get a, I need to get a good night's sleep. Um, but uh, and then as far as like my family and other things go, you know my thing is I try to get up in the morning and make sure that I do the most important things first. Mm -hmm. So on my calendar, that's like I, get, I wake up and I go play with my kids. And then if I, I try to do something healthy or you know, I eat something good and I try to get some exercise or do something good. And I've got, and I try not to schedule meetings in the morning. That only works so well. But I've got some time for me to like get whatever I think is the most important thing I want to get done that day done. And then the rest of my day starts to then fill up. And then I also have to think a lot about evenings, especially most importantly now that I have young kids. Right. And, um, and so you know, it's really easy for all my evenings to fill up during the week. And then, and then for me to need to go to a hackathon on the weekend and then go to judge some three-day startup thing on, on Sunday night. And, then, um, and so you know, I'm definitely 
uh, so, so I've got a date night on the week with my wife once a, once a week, where it's like Wednesday nights is date night, and that's like time for us to get some time to go out together. Um, and, uh, and then with my kids, I try to make sure that you know, there's some balance in there too, that I'm always you know, home, home for them in the evenings, uh, at, least, at least like you know, half, the, half the nights if I can. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I, and, I, and I find that works really well for me. Like I feel like I get lots of time with my wife, and I get lots of time with my kids, and, uh, and, I'm, and I'm super happy. But you know, I, I do think that's really different for everybody. So you're, you're a bit of a uh, productivity guru. Always call you up, or Deborah always calls you up when, when, uh, when we need advice on different productivity tools. Slash IT support. Yes. Slash IT support sometimes. Um, what what are what are some of your what's like your top three favorite productivity tools for people in here? Favorite productivity tools. That's a great. I was not expecting you to ask that. That's a great question. <laughs> I'm trying um, to keep you on your toes. Yeah. So uh, let's see. You know, so most of it happens on your phone these days, right? So um, I you know I certainly use. I I think I've crossed the cusp where I use my phone more than my computer now. Not like completely, but getting there. And so I would look here. So um, so one, and I'm. I'm, I'm up to disclosure, I'm, I'm an investor in this company. But um, one's this, this app called Tout App. And basically what it lets you do is queue up email templates. So I've got like, there's a couple emails I send a lot. So like I've got one email <clears throat> that's like my business card. I don't print business cards anymore. And so it's like an intro and my bio and my LinkedIn and my V card. And then, and then like if you want to keep reading, like a whole bunch of other stuff about like sign up for the Startup Digest and <laughs> do these other things. And so when I meet somebody, I can just launch this and type in their email address and fire that off to them really quick. Uh, it's a tool that's actually made for salespeople. So like if you're doing mm -hmm. sales stuff and you meet somebody, you can do that. But it's also great if you're fundraising for your investors. So you have like your investor emails. Like you meet an investor and then you want to send them your like your deck or your, like your NDA or like your something else. Or you don't just send investors NDAs, but it's also good for sending NDAs. Um, but um, but so you can kind of like queue up all your investor communications and it tracks if they opened it or not and some other things that you can go see. So. That's pretty good for that. I use Evernote. I use uh, a to-do list manager called OmniFocus for like my personal to-dos, and then Asana for like managing my team and all their kind of tasks and stuff like that. I use uh, a, a, a thing called Text Expander, which is on the phone or on uh, on your computer, which basically just lets you make little short phrases that then expand into big chunks of stuff. So I have a lot of those things I can do a lot, um, and. Uh, and I'm like a pro at, I never thought I would ever say this, but I'm like a pro at Eventbrite, Facebook events, like setting up stuff online. I can, right. like somehow I can just, I, I don't know what it is, but I do all that really fast because yeah. I'm doing that all the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so students in are in the room. They're here. They're obviously interested in entrepreneurship, I'm assuming, or they wouldn't be here. Um, what's your best advice for them? They're in school. So I mean, I think there's kind of two groups of things. There's like someone who knows they want to do something and they know what they want to do. They're super passionate about it. That's, that's kind of the best thing because then you're like, you're focused and you know what it is and you really, you're, you're there. And then it's like, just do it. Just dive in as fast as you can, get experience with it, learn about it, but start doing it as soon as you can because kind of that racetrack analogy, the sooner you make it one time around the loop, the sooner you, you learn about it, um, the, the, the easier it's going to be, the faster it's going to go, the sooner you can go take another lap. And, um, with all due respect to the business school and other things, I think there's a lot of valuable skills that you can learn here. There's a lot you can learn on the, on the job, you know, like as you're doing it, and a lot of people do that. Um, and it's different skills. There's other things, but, and then some of them, the sooner you get doing it, the better. If you don't know what you want to do, if you're not, you don't have something you're passionate about, then um, find someone who's passionate about something and latch on to them and find a way that you can be part of something and that you can learn from that. Because even if you didn't start Bizarre Voice, there were so many people at Bizarre Voice that learned so much in that process that now they're ready to go do it, right? Like maybe, you know, uh, take, take uh, Garrett you know, from Compare Metrics. And so he was at Bizarre Voice, he was on a team there, he learned about all, all kinds of stuff. He learned about their business, he learned about their customers, he learned how to grow a team, he met all these people he wanted to go work, that he could go work with. So then at, after Bizarre Voice, now he was inspired, then he was passionate, then he knew the thing he wanted to go do, and he had all the tools and the resources and the people and the experience that needed to go pull all that together. So if you don't have that thing, go latch onto somebody else. But I do think, as a student, this is a, one of, an incredible time 
to start a company or to be involved in a startup. Um, and, and it's only going to get harder for you. You'll get other advantages later, but, but in a lot of ways, this is the best time. For one, and obviously this is a generalization. I'm sure there's exceptions here as well, but, but you don't really have a life yet. Um, and when I mean that in all the best ways, but like you, you just, you, as over time, life just accumulates. You meet more and more people that you care about. And it's like, just think of like how many birthdays you have to go to or celebrate, right? Like, like you get more of them as you know more people, right? Um, you become part of things. You get, you get passionate about other organizations, other, not other charities or, or groups, or you get into dancing or bowling or whatever it is you do. You collect all these things that take up your time that you need to do. And then eventually you have a family. And that takes up a lot of time and isn't really important. That's when the birthdays really kick in. Then the birthdays really kick in. You go to yeah. all the kids' birthdays. Like I have three kids. If I want to take all of them to ACL, I have to it's take like one each day. three and multiply by 10 friends apiece. Right. So, so you've got 30 and in days sports games, birthdays. all these things yeah. are coming. And so, and so what you're, one of your biggest advantages you have right now is that you have more time than Brett. Like, I guarantee you, if you go start a company right now, the amount of hours you will put into it is twice what Brett will. And even if, I'm not saying Brett's slacking off or anything. He's just got a whole bunch of other stuff he's got to go do. That he's, and, you know, and he has other advantages that allow him to go faster that make it good for him to start a company now. But your advantage is, is you can work twice as much. And you can do twice as much. And that is a huge advantage. That is a really big advantage. And you can do a lot with a little. And so I think that's one great reason to start it now um, and to start it in, in college. I mean, I will say while, while I was in school, and I'd love to hear your comment on this if you were still getting seven, eight hours of... Uh, of sleep a week, but you know, when I was in school, I was so passionate about being an entrepreneur that I was working on my startups until three, four in the morning almost every single night. Yeah, I mean, I just had boundless energy, and that gets harder no as you get older. I mean, unfortunately. Yeah. So I, I, I totally, I, I totally in agree. The fraternity house, it would be like now. Friday night, and the party started at ten, and so like ten thirty, I'm still at my computer working, but I've got like the door open so I can hear the party. And there's people like kind of like walking by, you know, and like, and of course, they're all making fun of me. The whole, like, what, why are you working? What are you doing? Right. Loser, party. get home, come party, what, you know, whatever. Um, but, um, but then you're like, hey, I'm responsible for your paycheck. Don't forget that. <laughs> now these, now I can say that. But, but, but you know, but, and I would, no, so I'm I, saying you were employing your, your well, a couple brother. of them, yeah, a couple of them. <laughs> but, um, but you know, and I'd still go to the party, but I would work till maybe 11, right? right. And like, and it was already a party was already going, and then I'd go downstairs and party for a while, and then probably about two o'clock, I'd probably be back upstairs working again and like doing right. something else, right? That's how it's done. Um, why don't we, why don't we open it up to uh, questions? From the audience, we have a little bit of time left. Um, and do you mind? Is it too much to ask you to go up to the mic, or do you just want to shout it out and I can repeat it? Um, I can do. I can it hear you. Why don't I repeat sure. it just so it'll show well on video? I love your philosophy about helping other people build entrepreneurship. I think that's great, and I feel the same way. Quit their jobs. Quit their jobs. Yeah. Um, agreed. Totally. I, I've helped people quit their jobs too. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. You mind, you mind just repeating? So the, the, the question was, how does crowdfunding via equity fit into Capital Factories plans, and what's that mean for startups? And um, I think it's a great thing. I'm really excited about it. I think we've been kind of teasing that area through things like AngelList, which weren't quite public fundraising, but we're pretty darn close to public fundraising already. And that's been a huge impact, has really helped a lot of companies to raise money and be successful. And so I think that's going to continue to do more of that. I think it's going to mean more companies getting funded more different ways, getting, uh, getting uh, more resources, and that's only going to mean more good things. Um, lots of bad things will get funded. But that's, our, I mean, that's, the, that's the way this works. Like, not everything works. But more people trying is good. More people having the opportunity is good. Um, and what I think is, you know, you, you specifically said equity fund, uh, crowdfunding. Stepping back from that a minute, even just Kickstarter. What's, what's, what I love about Kickstarter is I see numerous companies who come along and can't get funded. They can't get anyone to invest in them. And they're like about to give up. It's like, oh crap, let's just throw up a Kickstarter. And then they raise a million dollars on Kickstarter, right? And this thing that like couldn't get the VCs to believe in it, they actually just jumped over the VCs and got 
got, got the customers to pay. And that's, that's amazing, right? And then suddenly now the VCs all want to invest because they got a bunch of customers signed up and paying. Um, and I think that's incredible. That's awesome. And I think we're going to see more opportunities for things that couldn't have gotten funded some other way and just wouldn't have worked out. But it does work because there's more, more different resources to tap into. I think it's going to be great. Yeah. I would agree. I think it's radically disruptive and um, to the benefit of the entrepreneur. The only caveat I would say is that make sure you have good mentors. And sometimes those mentors are available um, at firms that do that for a living. Um, and they have a level of pattern recognition. So if, if I invest in something on you know, Kickstarter or something like that, I'm not going to have the same affinity as if I um, serve on their board and meet with them regularly and you know, have coffee with them in Austin, that kind of thing. So yeah. So for both you guys, John, are you recording this whole thing on Google Not. Glass? All right. Uh, took one photo. <laughs> nice. But so in both of your cases, and a lot of uh, mentors I have as well, you're the person with your hands on the keyboard at the beginning, the mechanic, the engineer, the person really archetyping this idea that you have. But then eventually you become the leader. Um, do you find yourself, or had you found yourself, where you felt yourself disconnecting as the knowledge expert, and then you were just the leader? Or, um, or maybe not. And if, if it's not, sure. how do you still remain the knowledge expert in that field because you're inundated with running the company instead of being uh, with your fingers and grease? You want to take that? Just repeat. The, yeah. So the, the question stuff. was, um, you know, at some point as the company grows, if you start out as a kind of a technical founder or a, 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 a business expert founder, you're really an expert at the problem. You're really knee deep in it. And then at some point, the company grows to a point where other people take on those day-to-day -day tasks, and you're more running the company, not being the expert at the business. And what's that feel like, and what, how do you deal with it, and what's it like? And um, I definitely have gone through that. I was always the first kind of subject matter expert, and usually the first kind of technical person building it or doing something with it. And for me, the first part of that was actually just when I didn't even know the code well enough anymore. When it was like, you know, like realizing like I couldn't fix something, or like I can't go change something, or like the first time you think you're going to go change something, and then you just break everything. Um, and uh, and then and that was kind of weird. I kind of feel like a poser. Like I like still think of myself as really technical, but I actually can't really build anything anymore, right? And so like I can still manage people to build stuff, and I can architect stuff, and I can I know how the things fit together, but like total bad use of time for me to go try to actually code anything anymore. And that makes me that actually feels kind of bad. Um, and. Uh, and then the next level beyond that would be the even just like, are you the expert at the product kind of thing? I think, I think that's easier to stay longer. Um, and because uh, you, even as the a leader of the company, you talk to a lot of customers and you, you know, you're more involved in those ways. So that doesn't necessarily have to go. But certainly the, uh, the feeling of like, I built it. I know how it all works. I know exactly what we can do. Um, and again, if you start in that role, then in the, it's great. Like in the initial sales and other things like that, like you can be talking to somebody and you know what the technical capabilities are, so you can make commitments and you know you can hit them. And then at some point that breaks down and you make some commitment that you can't really hit, and then 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 you feel then you realize, okay, I got to bring I bring one of the one of the other guys with me next time. Um, so uh, so I think that's a natural kind of evolution. But for me, it, it's more the 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 tech expertise that I felt like I lost more than the business expertise. I don't know if what yeah, you this is. Uh, it's a very disarming feeling to realize that you've transcended your background. Um, and you now don't know how to program nearly as well as those that are in your company. And I actually think there's a great lesson, a very deep lesson here for entrepreneurs. Um, I've, I meet a lot of people in Austin that are their own worst enemy. And what I mean by that, and it's not just in Austin, it's anywhere, is that they are such perfectionists that they've got to have their arms on the entire business and know how everything functions. And they are literally strangling their business. Um, and you've got to transcend that to grow. And the hardest thing for me in growing Bizarre Voice and going from you know, just me and my co-founder to over 800 people in that shorter period of time is I'd never done that before. And so I had to transcend over and over and over again. I leveraged CEO coach. I leveraged uh, um, lots of people for different management and leadership training within the company. It also benefited me. 
Um, I had three coaches just for the IPO event alone, um, which was gut wrenching, and they were brutal on me, and you know, just simulated exactly what it'd be like to be in the room with people that manage trillions of dollars in capital, just pounding on me with questions, and and um, and it's it's hard. I mean, it's very very hard, um, but it's the only way. And and you know, I think that you know, someone like a, a Michael Dell has transcended so many times, you know, from the time he was a student here at UT till now that it's almost miraculous. His best advice is to make sure you're not the smartest person in the room. Michael Dell's best advice is to make sure you're not the smartest person in the room. Surround yourself with people. Yeah, I mean, that's very true. I mean, you know, if, if you feel like you need to be, that's a real problem. You're probably one of those people that's strangling your, your business. Um, and uh, you know, there's no reason to be arrogant because there's always someone better looking, more successful, smarter, you know, everything. I mean, any, any dimension you want to compare yourself in, it's just better to compare yourself to yourself and, and be your own critic. You know, one of the things I found with, uh, slightly related but a little bit of a tangent, is with my first company, I wanted, I, I strangled it a bit. I wanted everything to be perfect. I expected everything to be perfect. I was trying to make everything perfect, which you're never going to do. So I was a total hard ass. I was just really driving everybody really hard. I, was, I, could, I could not be nice to be around sometimes. Um, and, uh, and I had very high expectations. And I was, I was really frustrated a lot. And I found with my second business, it actually, I realized that, one, people make mistakes. So if people are making mistakes, that means you generally have bad systems. Like, you don't assume people, don't try to make a plan that assumes nobody's gonna make a mistake. Try to make a plan that allows for people to make mistakes, because people are gonna make mistakes. And two, that some of the problems or mistakes that you come across uh, as your business grows are actually just the sign of it growing. And that if I, in some ways, it's very inefficient to try to stay ahead of all the problems, because then you're doing stuff you don't need to do before that's a real problem. And sometimes the way you know that you need to evolve or change your business or work in a different way is because you start to hit some of those problems. And so with my first business, we hit a problem. I'd be like, ah, why did we have that problem? How do we make sure that never happens again? With my second business, it was like, oh, that problem. That means we're now, we're at this size now. We're having that thing. Oh, I know how to deal with that problem. Cool. It wasn't, and so it wasn't nearly as stressful because it was like, it was more actually even comforting. It was like, great, we've, we're big enough to have that problem. And I know how to fix that problem. So great, well now we'll fix that problem. We'll do that next thing. Um, and that really helped me to let go and, and relax a little bit. Yeah, I've been through the same. Um, who else? Um, let, me, let me go to her and then you. Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. So you want to repeat the question? The question was, so. what, is there one trait or characteristic you've noticed mm -hmm. among people that you see early on as an entrepreneur that tells you they're going to be successful? I'm I've, got, sure, I've got my answer. For yeah, that. I'm sure there are a lot of different things to this. I'll tell you, I asked um, Kevin Kettler, who was at the time the CTO of Dell, I asked him a similar question. And he had said that the number one trait he looks for in, in, up in, in this case, it was an up-and-coming executive, but somebody that was able to be a leader was the ability to make good decisions with less and less information. And kind of, and, and because you never have perfect information, uh, and you, you know, you're in, to be able to move quickly and grow as, as, and as, you, as the company grows and you kind of step higher up in the chain, you need to be able to do that more and more. So I think that's one interesting trait. You know, the number one thing I really look for in an early stage entrepreneur and a first time entrepreneur, it's passion about the thing that they're doing. It's like, there's no perfect thing and it's possible that somebody could be really passionate about it and hit the wall, but I, I think that's the number one thing that sticks out. Like you meet somebody and you're like, that person is not gonna fail. That person is not gonna let any other option than winning be here because they're so, because they're so passionate about what they do. And that, that's so compelling to everybody you meet, to investors, to customers, to to anybody. Yeah, that, it's similar to my answer. I mean, one thing I would encourage you to do while you're here at the university is go see every entrepreneur you can possibly see speak. And I bet that you'll find that they have one thing in common because they all look different. You know, some are 
skinny, some are, you know, fat, some are female, some are male, you know, all different ethnicities. Some are geeky, you know, some are really professional. Right. Yeah, some are academic type, except the, the only thing that you'll find that they have in common is persistence. And passion will make you persistent. Yes. And so whenever, whenever I'm looking um, at whether or not I'll invest in an entrepreneur, I'm looking at them to act like that. And a lot of people don't act that way. And they don't act that way because they're not genuinely passionate. The number one way that uh, we ensured that we would have a great culture at Bizarre Voice is we set up like massive obstacles for them getting a job. We made it brutally difficult, um, whereas the filter was so high. Um, and you know, at the last part of the process, after everything else, gave them a 16-hour test over the weekend to ensure that they wanted the job and that they were passionate about it. And that directly led to our company getting a lot of accolades for being the best place to work. Um, it was that action. And I'm the same way when I'm looking at an entrepreneur. Um, the entrepreneur should be undyingly persistent, passionate about it. Um, and if they're not, then life's too short. You know, someone else will be. So why don't we have one last question. You had a question in the back, and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, um, this question for both of you. In, in the world of business and entrepreneurship, if you had to pick your maybe top three authors or visionaries or thinkers, who, who would you pick? So the, the question is the top three authors um, that we would pick, but for business authors or just people that inspire us? So I guess I'm thinking more inspirational, whether it's okay. psychology, entrepreneurship, sure. kind of the business world, the economy. Yeah. So the, the, the most inspirational book I read last year um, was called Abundance. And I wrote a very long review of that on my blog, um, lucky7.io. And I wrote, I wrote a long blog post on it because I wanted to remember it 10 years from now, and I wanted to be able to reference back to it. Um, so it's actually the longest book review. I've never written a book review that long for school. Um, it's the longest book review I've ever written, period. Um, and that's, ri that's written by uh, Peter Diamatis, who uh, is the founder of SpaceX and um, all different types of, all different types of uh, enterprises, Singularity University. And um, it's absolutely a fascinating read. And it'll give you 100,000 business ideas if you just open your mind when you read it. Um, I'm also a huge fan of the Patrick Lencioni books, all of them. Um, I like The Five Temptations of a CEO. I like them because they're fables, so you can really get into it and, and really get personal with the uh, story. And, and if you've ever been a leader of anything, it'll speak, speak to your soul really well. Um, and I think the most important book ever written for entrepreneurs, and it's actually the only book that both Steve Jobs and Andy Grove both said um, that their quote was something to the extent of, this is the only business book I've read that has any value. Because um, neither one of them liked business books. Um, and that book is The Innovator's Dilemma by uh, Clayton Christensen. That is a phenomenal read, and that'll get your mindset to shift from it's already been done before to it's already been done before, and that's why I can disrupt the whole industry and you know take it down like Elon Musk is doing simultaneously in three industries at once. Yeah, yeah, I'd really agree with uh, Clayton Christopher and uh, Innovators Dilemma. Clayton's also just an incredible speaker. If you ever have a chance to see him or go, there's lots of his videos online. Very worthwhile to go watch him tell his story. Um, I would name three books that I often recommend to, to particularly to entrepreneurs. Um, the first one, very tactical, really short read. It's a Ken Blanchard book called The One Minute Manager. It was one of the first management books I read. And uh, Who Moved My Cheese is another one in that thing that's a good one too. Um, but in particularly, it, it's very short, it's fable based, and, uh, and it's really just about keeping it simple. And it's, I think it's a management philosophy that's stuck with me. Um, you know, for a long time. It probably doesn't work in every situation. It might not be the situation for a really big company, um, but for a lot of smaller companies, I think it, it works really well, and it's particularly when you're getting started. Uh, the second one is uh, a book called 
the hypomaniac edge. And hypomania is like when you're a little bit crazy. And this book is about how entrepreneurs are, and many of the most successful entrepreneurs are all a little bit crazy. They're a little unusual in how they do things and extreme and really passionate and have these kind of quirky traits. But they're just crazy enough to like make them go further than everybody else. But, n but they're like highly functionally crazy. So it's like it, just enough that it actually works to their advantage versus like bringing them down. And it points to all these examples through history of people that had this trait, people with our founding fathers, Alexander Hamilton, and, um, uh, and then you know, Henry Ford, and other people uh, m moving up to you know, Steve Jobs and other people like that, and, uh, and pointing out these traits that you see um, about them. And it, and it really gets back even just the people that immigrated here. You think about you know, what it was like to get on a boat in the 1700s and move to the US. Like, you were getting on a, on a boat for a multiple months journey that was dangerous, where people died, going to a place you've never seen a picture of, and you've never talked to anyone that's been there, in the hopes of making a new life and, and starting something new. That's about as entrepreneurial as it gets, mm -hmm. um, and, and risky. And so that was the, the spirit of the kind of people that came here, and that was uh, many of them fit that profile. So hy hypomaniac edge. And then the third one is, a, uh, for me, I think one of the most inspirational uh, entrepreneurial books. And it's, called, it's by a guy named Napoleon Hill. And it's called um, Think and Grow Rich. And that's the short version. There's a 16-volume there's a longer version of it. Uh, but Think and Grow Rich. And Napoleon Hill actually went to um, Carnegie. He was Andrew Carnegie. Um, went to Andrew Carnegie, and he um, was trying to get a job with him, and wanted him to like hire him. And he like stalked him, and like sat outside his office, and like finally got to meet with him, and kind of um, and asked him, you know, what what's your secret of success? How do you be successful? And uh, Carnegie uh, basically um, gave him a a, a stipend uh, and paid for him to go and research this, and introduced him to all the greatest entrepreneurs of the of the time. Um, and uh, you know Charles Schwab and all these other kind of um, great entrepreneurs then, and got to ask them these questions. And so he talked to all these great entrepreneurs, and he tried to distill it down into what he saw as um, really being the secret to success. And I think um, it's hard to just tell you the answer. Like you have to kind of hear the stories to really get it. But a big part of what it comes down to is really, I believe, is passion and really believing in yourself. And you know that's the common trait. Like. Almost everybody that makes it believed in themselves, <laughs> kind of by definition. But that's the hard thing. And the tough thing is, like, how do you believe in yourself and know that you're right versus crazy? Right? And that's like the entrepreneur's dilemma, right? Is like, you wouldn't be an entrepreneur and going and doing something and doing something differently if everybody else got it. Like, by definition, you kind of must see something everyone else doesn't see, right? But at the same time, you don't want to be the delusional person going off and doing something that's totally not possible, right? That isn't, isn't a good idea, and that's why nobody. So how do you know which one you are? You don't. Like, you got to figure that out for yourself. I think the answer is you marry well. <laughs> that, that too, yeah. <laughs> Deborah's need to bless every business I've started. Um, yeah. So hey, Josh, this has been a long time in the making. Yeah. Um, ever, since, ever since we uh, met. Really glad to know you, and uh, thanks so much for doing this. Um, it's a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you.